What's up guys and gals, it's Sean Mishka, Movement Master and OptimizeMovement.com coming to you with another movement lesson. Now most of you have definitely heard of the idea of the motor program, a very popular and conceptual theory which serves to explain that through learning, the perceptual motor behavior of an individual is changed by the central nervous system which goes to essentially store a set of commands which will be utilized through either open or closed loop type control to solve movement problems within our environment that we face. This theory is often looked at as being a complete opposite rival of that of the dynamical systems theory which we've discussed many times here before at Movement Mastery. The theory of the motor program however centers on information processing and, and this was made popular for decades by numerous movement scientists and theorists as a way for the brain to essentially act like a computer to process information and then produce the necessary motor outputs. That is really till some who were opposed to the idea started to really poke holes in the theory for its limitations in describing how the brain could possibly overcome a number of very apparent issues at hand. The first one, how it, the brain, could store the information in motor programs for the nearly limitless number of movement patterns that human individuals are required to perform. The second issue is how could it be that novelty movements like those that have never been performed by the individual, individual before, how could it be that they possibly be controlled if there wasn't a motor program intact for them to begin with. And because of this, a pretty knowledgeable and often published movement scientist named Richard Schmidt offered an alternative characterization view of the motor program for us to, to kind of think about this. And this was a way to solve these storage and novelty issues. And this has really been come to uh, be known as the generalized motor program or the schema theory. For starters, this generalized motor program will still consist of a stored pattern of movement uh, with a certain amount of pre-structured motor commands which are still organized at the executive level, the brain level of the nervous system. But here with the generalized motor program, the biodynamic structure so meaning how the brain carries out behaviors that are going to set up the biomechanics to overcome the problems. This, this biodynamic structure is going to be more abstract, generalized if you will, than that of the motor program ideals often described prior to that point. So this generalized motor program can then be applied to more variable conditions and be modified according to those conditions closer to that of the ideas that we would find that the organism goes through uh, with self-organization theories proposed in the dynamical systems concepts. Through the existence then of the generalized motor program, it essentially counters that concern, or those concerns I should say, that some had about the storage and novelty problems and issues. As here with the generalized motor program then, not every movement pattern would need a separate motor program in the brain. So let me repeat that so you don't get confused. With the generalized motor program theory, not every movement pattern is going to need a separate motor program in the brain. Instead, you know, the generalized motor program would cover a class of actions all of which would be represented and stored as the, in the brain as the same generalized motor program which would only be adjusted later based on the context of the environment and what is going to be changed or witnessed in the task. You know, so some of you may be asking, how can this be? Well, when producing the response in motor behavior, according to the generalized motor programming theory, the individual would simply need to alter the key parameters, otherwise known as the variance of the, the task or of the generalized motor program, they would need to alter those key parameters, those variants, that will be specific to that particular situation that the individual finds him or herself in. You know, there will be some parameters which are variant, meaning changeable, and then there's going to be others which are invariant, obviously non-changeable. 
and the parameters then will be altered and modified based on the present movement problem. These parameters that I'm speaking on could be things like the speed and the duration of the movement. Maybe the movement amplitude or the direction of that movement or the force being exerted on the given repetition or execution. And you know, these things are the things that we find which are usually determined to be variants of that generalized motor program depending on the class of actions. That which is often invariant is usually going to be the overall relative timing of the overall movement. And, and this serves to just kind of keep the general temporal and spatial organization intact to be associated with that particular class of motor actions. Meaning if the movement pattern is from a certain class of motor actions, such as running or throwing or jumping or what have you, fill in the blank, the execution of the motor pattern will still originate from the same generalized motor program and you will be able to decipher it as such even if the parameters have differed from previous attempts of that same athlete executing a similar movement pattern. Overall then, through the use of the generalized motor program, the technical execution of the movement pattern will fit more under the Bernstein ideas of repetition without repetition that you've heard me talk about before. But yet it will still be organized and controlled at the hierarchical level here of the central nervous system. And each time that the movement is performed, such as through practice, the generalized motor program or that schema will get constructed more firmly to be linked together and will essentially become more robust or I should say a more robust representation in the brain that is able to be used in a variety of settings which of course can then lead to enhanced transferability to sport domains. And of course like with other ideas of motor control and motor learning, as the athlete acquires a skill through practice and experience he or she will begin to improve upon their mastery level. You know that's intuitively obvious and thereby at the same time they will get more precise and more fluid in the control of the movement and its given variations where they begin to recall and recognize the situations where using the generalized motor program will be required and they will start to learn how to make adjustments to it while also improving error detection and correction and of course overall raising the level of movement ownership and movement virtuosity. All of these things, of course, are the product of movement skill acquisition and the process of it. But the generalized motor program theory is essentially just a way of describing how the movement is actually being controlled throughout that process. So basically, I just wanted to begin this two-part movement lesson by explaining the concept for you to offer a little clarity as well as form a line of distinction between this theory and others of motor control that we have discussed here in the past. So in part two of this movement lesson, we will uh, actually go to the whiteboard and look at the generalized motor program more graphically and then discuss how movement patterns are proposed to be controlled through it as well as through the use of open and closed loop control of that generalized motor program conceptual model. So hopefully that was helpful. For another movement lesson, this has been Sean Mishka, Movement Master in OptimizeMovement.com. Till next time, I'll talk to you on the flip side. And until then, let's continue to master the art of optimizing movement.